Hi, I'm Nicola Jennings, one of the co-founders of Athena Art Foundation. This is Athena Asks, a podcast where we talk to artists, curators, historians and collectors about their work, pre-modern art and the world today. Hello, my name is Dr. Madeline Haddon. I am a curator and art historian and member of the Brain Trust of the Athena Art Foundation. And I am so pleased to introduce as our guest today on Athena Asks, my friend and colleague, Elise Nelson, Assistant Curator in the Department of European Sculpture and Decorative Art at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. We will be discussing her groundbreaking exhibition, Fictions of Emancipation, Carpo Recast, which she co-curated with Wendy S. Walters, Director of the Nonfiction Concentration, an associate professor in the writing program at the School of the Arts at Columbia. At the Met, Elise is responsible for 18th and 19th century European sculpture and cameos. Prior to her curatorial appointment in 2019, Elise assisted in the organization of Rodin at the Met in 2017 and Like Life Sculpture Color in the Body in 2018. She's previously held fellowships at the Met and the Paul Mellon Center for Studies in British Art and taught art history at the Berklee College of Music. Elise studied art history at Yale University, received an MA with distinction from the Courtauld, and is completing her PhD thesis on Canova's British patronage at the Institute of Fine Arts. Elise, welcome, and thank you so much for being here today. Hi, Madeline, and thank you so much for uh, inviting me to join you. So excited to have this conversation. So we have a lot that we hope to get into today. There's so much to discuss in the context of this really fantastic, groundbreaking show. Many of our listeners may not have seen the exhibition yet, and luckily they'll have um, ample time to do so, but hoping you could give us a brief overview of the exhibition and its key objectives and arguments. So Fictions of Emancipation, Carpo Recast, is an exhibition that critically examines the representation of the Black figure in 19th century Western art, uh, mostly European in this exhibition, um, in the wake of the abolition of slavery. It centers around a single iconic work, Why Born Enslaved, um, a bust created by Jean-Baptiste Carpeau, the French sculptor in 1868. And it seeks to reframe this important, you know, well-known sculpture by considering it within an expanded historical context. Uh, Previously, the work and many works like it that carry abolitionist messages have been considered and understood within museum contexts in particular in their relationship to abolitionist discourse. Uh, This exhibition considers it within an expanded historical context, as I said, uh, considering the histories of European colonialism and imperialism, of course, slavery and its abolition, but also capitalism, um, the burgeoning pseudoscientific field of ethnography, um, and the way these complex kind of intersecting histories that are so essential to our understanding of the 19th century kind of intersect in this really compelling, important uh, work of art. The exhibition is basically conceived of with this work of art at the center, literally and conceptually. It is a small exhibition of around 35 works of art, and groupings of uh, objects are at, around the perif- perimeter of the gallery. It's, it's a single gallery exhibition. There's a group of abolitionist and kind of emancipatory works of art, uh, works of art that explore the uh, four continents imagery and its relationship to imperialism. Um, and for, the four continents imagery is relevant in this context because Why Born Enslaved was uh, designed while Carpeau was working on the allegorical figure of Africa for his Four Continents sculpture um, that is now just south of the Luxembourg Gardens. Um, and so this context of imperialism really comes to bear on, on the bust. There's a, a grouping of objects that are kind of ethnographic or, or linked to ethnography and a group of courtiers Carpeau's work is deeply indebted to the work of Cordier, where this mode of naturalism is really, you know, prominent. And uh, so Cordier's works 
um, a bust after Saeed and Kess and the so-called African Venus are uh, incredible loans from the Art Institute of Chicago and are really important works for, for our audience to begin kind of grappling with the thorny business of ethnographic sculpture. Other key works in the exhibition would include Edmonia Lewis's Forever Free. This is a work that is in the section about kind of abolitionist um, themes or emancipatory themes. Um, and her work is a, an important foil to Why Born Enslaved. It's created by an artist who is, you know, a female uh, mixed race, both African American and indigenous uh, artist uh, working at the same moment as Carpo. And she creates um, a sculpture that is from a very different perspective of a, of a couple, a black male and female couple. She is kneeling while he stands holding in his left hand that's raised above his head, the broken uh, chains or shackles of, of slavery. This is a work created in 1867, just a year before Carpo creates his work, uh, in which the female figure is still bound. A work like that serving as an important foil to demonstrate the ways in which emancipation was being represented or misrepresented um, at this particular moment in time. Finally, uh, one key work I wanted to mention is, is Kara Walker's mold, um, plas a plaster work called Negress, which she took from a contemporary replica of Why Born Enslaved. And uh, this is included in a section where we explore the replication of Why Born Enslaved. It, it's a work that is incredibly well known today because it was reproduced both during and after Carpo's lifetime. It was reproduced to the extent that it is now you know, in museums in Europe and uh, the United States. Therefore, it's well known to a public audience. It, continues to be reproduced today and in expensive resin copies that are available online. It's become really part of popular culture. And this is another reason why this, this work felt like a really important object around which we could focus this exhibition um, because of its visibility. It's so well known and has a lot to offer us in terms of our understanding of the past and the present. And Carol Walker's work really beautifully and hauntingly, I think, captures the legacies of this work as um, really ambivalent, as she takes a mold of a contemporary replica of the work and leaves us with the kind of hollow void. Rather than using the mold to create yet another replica, she leaves us with that negative space that sort of stares back at us and begs uh, questions, I think, about the past and its impact on the present. Lastly, I think I will say that, you know, Why Born Enslaved, being created in 1868 during the Second Empire in France by an artist who had a strong relationship to Napoleon III and those in power, this is a work that was created with the intentions of appealing to an audience at this moment, both a, a broad art buying audience, as well as his favorite audience, that of the emperor himself. And so its relationship to abolitionist discourse uh, being created 20 years after the abolition of slavery in 1848 throughout the French empire is precarious and has always been a subject of question, you know, has been sort of vexing to art historians. And one of the goals and ambitions of the exhibition was to you know, reframe this work broadly within the context of colonialism so that one might better understand the ways in which abolitionist works of art or works of art that carry an abolitionist message appealed to French and European audiences at a moment when abolition was a subject that was being celebrated as a source of great national pride um, during a moment of expanding colonial reach in North Africa. Um, in other words, you know, abolition and colonialism were not seen as these kind of contradictory moments, but rather one serving as a justification for the other and seen as part of this arc of progress in enlightened Europe. Um, and so the 
relevance and importance of celebrating abolition at this moment during the Second Empire, it wasn't random. This was part of, you know, the zeitgeist of, the, of that moment. And Carpeau understood this. And so he creates this work to sort of support and advance those ideas and ide fundamental ideologies. Um, so it's therefore possible for a work of art to carry an abolitionist message as this work does. It it's, you know, depicts a woman who is bound by rope but resisting against that as she throws her head over her shoulder and is twisting against the ropes that bind her body. And it's inscribed with this inscription, Pourquoi naître esclave, which we have translated to why born enslaved, it ends in an exclamation point. So it's sort of a protest against the conditions of slavery and very much a provocation to the viewer of the bust at that time to consider this question to which they know the answer. So it carries that abolitionist message, but at the same time is also very much a work that kind of reinscribes racial inequality through its representation of a subjugated, you know, bound, racialized, eroticized type of woman, uh, a black woman. And so Again, while that seems quite contradictory to have an abolitionist work that um, also in some ways sort of dramatizes this subjugated image of a woman, that wasn't necessarily contradictory to audiences at that time. That would have been really the language that they understood to kind of reinforce racial inequality um, while celebrating abolition as, again, a source of national pride. I really appreciate in the exhibition and in other interviews I've, I've heard you give about the exhibition how well you articulate that tension. I think that's incredibly important to elucidate the tension between a what seemingly celebration of multiculturalism but within a very strict racial hierarchy at the same time. Um, it reminds me often of, in some ways, the cultural landscape we still exist today. And I think you make that connection so well in the exhibition. Another thing I really love about it is within a, you know, not extremely large amount of space, you use every single ounce of it so cunningly. And there's nothing wasted and, you know, spanning from the late 18th century through to contemporary art of Hinde Wiley and, and Carol Walker. Something that I wanted to touch about today in our conversation is really not only the subject matter of the show, but the really bold innovation of its curatorial practice, particularly in its displays of interpretation and visitor engagement. You've really achieved multiple voices and perspectives existing side by side within the gallery texts in particular, um, in order to contemplate questions that are extremely critical to our field at this particular moment. These questions are addressed within the gallery texts, and I, I wanna take the time to read them out because I think they're especially important. Who narrates history? What is representation? What is abolition? And what is the legacy of the Black figure in Western art? And you give an opportunity for voices besides your and Wendy's to respond to these questions um, and for viewers to be able to, to read those responses and contemplate them while they're experiencing the exhibition. What was your process for developing this? And did you know from the exhibition's inception that you wanted to go in this avant-garde direction? Is this a model that you think can be adapted to other installations or exhibitions that you hope to use in, in your future work? Or is this one that you think was really unique to the issues at hand in this particular show? Sure. So, I mean, I would say that, you know, this direction really began with Wendy and my collaboration. You know, Wendy is an associate professor and the head of nonfiction writing at the School of Arts at Columbia University. Um, and she's a writer and a poet. And she and I began collaborating together when Sarah Lawrence, the head of the Department of European Sculpture and Decorative Arts, acquired the bust by Born Enslaved in 2019. And I supported that endeavor. And immediately we started brainstorming how we would present this work to the public at a moment when it encapsulates so much of the troubling history that we're kind of still faced with today. So we reached out to Wendy, whose voice we thought could lend a really powerful perspective. And we asked her if she would write a poem in response to Why Born Enslaved to be featured on our Met Collects digital presentation of the work. And she wrote a poem called In the Gallery, 
in which she speaks from the perspective of the woman who posed for, the anonymous model who posed for the work. And it occurred to me at that moment, this is before the exhibition had been proposed and approved, that this is a work of art and a subject matter that would benefit from thinking outside of the box and thinking beyond the traditional art historical parameters to bring its history um, into focus. So I would say the exhibition planning and process was interdisciplinary from the start because of my work with Wendy. I was so kind of moved by the perspective and again voice she, she brought that as I was developing the exhibition then asked if she would work with me to co-curate the project. We felt that the works of art on display they obviously are part of art history and they engage with, but also transcend art historical kind of considerations. You know, the works of art kind of resonate on all of these different registers because of how important the conversation about representation is today to our current, you know, social and political landscapes. And so we wanted to bring that to the fore. Um, and so it wasn't with an idea of, oh, let's do something innovative, or let's do something, you know, you used the term, not me, avant-garde. Um, it was really just how, how can we allow these works of art to register with our visitors on different levels? But we didn't know what it would look like in the space or how we would implement it until we were you know, really in the thick of things in, in this process. Collaboration was really essential to this project from the beginning. Of course, there's Wendy and my curatorial collaboration, but beyond that, we worked with so many, you know, intellectual partners throughout. I would say that process began with a convening of scholars that we had about a year before the exhibition opened. Uh, it was a really kind of diverse and broad group of art historians who provided we, we had a day, sort of study day together, um, and they helped us really workshop and work through the ideas uh, in the exhibition. Um, that was a really pivotal and transformational day in terms of grappling with, you know, a, a lot of the underlying questions around, you know, colonialism and, and, and ethnography was a huge topic of discussion that day. Beyond that, we also, you know, we worked with a number of different art historians for the book and their voices are, you know, really provide the texture of the, of the argument of the show. Um, they're super, super, you know, important foundational art historians, or, or art historical uh, texts. I'm really proud of, of the texts they wrote. Um, and that book includes, you know, Adrian Childs, James Smalls, Iris Moon, uh, Caitlin Beach, Rachel Hunter Himes, Wendy, and myself. And Rachel was a graduate intern. She's a PhD student at Columbia. And she worked with us for over nine months, or about a year, I think, in total, uh, on the exhibition and was really integral to our development of the interpretation as well. So the exhibition was just, you know, collaborative in a number of these ways. And so including these what we call thematic labels, these labels addressing these questions that we asked ourselves with, you know, yet another group of people with whom we collaborate, could collaborate, felt meaningful and felt important. And it was it, part of the kind of ethos of the show's creation was to do that work consistently. In terms of the questions we wanted to ask, each of those questions is questions that Wendy and I were asking ourselves as we curated the show. And at some point it occurred to us that the questions themselves were so important, you know, just asking the question and having opening up discourse around the question. So there was a point where we considered just asking those questions within the space. But as we thought more about it, we thought this could be a way we could, we could let's ask non-curators and people from different disciplines to participate and, and answer these questions. What is the abolition of slavery? you know, as a historical event, but also why are we still talking about it today as an outcome that has yet to be fully achieved? 
you know, and this, of course, relates to the title of the show, Fictions of Emancipation. Another question, what is representation? You know, what do we mean when we talk about representation? What constitutes diverse representation? Does why born enslaved count as representation? You know, when it does not capture the personhood of the free woman who posed for it, uh, but rather kind of recasts her in a way. This is a question we have. And similarly, stemming from that would be then who narrates history? Representation according to whom? And so we just decided in, in, in the spirit of transparency and dialogue to put those questions out there. The people we worked with were, like I said, from a range of different disciplines and provided the most eloquent, beautiful, powerful responses. And we were just so honored to work with them. We, you know, uh, Farah Peterson, who is a professor of law, wrote on what is abolition. Lisa Farrington, the Dean of Visual Arts at, at Howard, wrote on who narrates history. We just had all these different, you know, interesting writers write responses. I think this is such a fantastic approach, not only because of its pertinence to the issues at hand, but I think to the discipline of art history more broadly. To be able to open up these discussions in a place like the Met, where a lot of this language, you know, as you said, let's think about representation, for example, there's always been an assumption that that is going to be defined by particular individuals and to open up that conversation or even to just define the terms that we need to enter these discussions that are not often defined outside of those of us who practice the discipline, I think is, is really a model that I hope more museums and exhibitions will start to use these opportunities. I think one of the most important components of this exhibition in this respect is really the concluding section in which the multiplicity of this perspective is opened up even further to visitors who are invited to write their own responses to the same questions um, that you pose to scholars and artists. So I'm curious if you could tell us a little bit about that process and if this kind of developed quite naturally from the approach that you and Wendy had to the gallery text. And if you could tell us more, I've, you know, I've been to the exhibition a couple of times now, so I've seen some of them, but if you can give a, a sense for our listeners, what kind of responses you have received and what have you taken away from these responses regarding the role of the museum and our curator in our present day? Because something I really love is that it questions the role of the museum and the curator within this. And that can be terrifying to some within our field, giving agency back to our, vis our visitors and viewers. You know, the idea for a response space stemmed from a very early conversation that Wendy and I had with our education department, in which Heidi Holder, the head of education, suggested that we have a space where visitors who come to the show are given the opportunity to absorb and reflect on what they've just seen and experienced. And she raised the important point that we have a responsibility to our visitors when we put works of art that can stir trauma and introduce racial trauma or, or violence. And of course, the centerpiece of this exhibition is a bust of an enslaved woman bound by rope. It always weighed heavily on Wendy and me, that we were asking our visitors to come with us on this journey and that it's it's a lot to ask to be confronted by this by this object and to engage with it in a sustained fashion. And so we worked for a year with a number of stakeholders. Uh, the Met has not had a reflection and response space such as this attached to an exhibition in the last 25 years or so. So this was really new, and therefore we wanted to do it carefully, always with the visitor's experience and being respectful of the visitor in mind. So we collaborated with design, of course, with education, with our Office of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and we thought long and hard about how, what, what were our intentions for this space. And... Early on, Wendy and I felt strongly that it, sh it should serve two purposes. One, as a space for rest and reflection, and two, as a space to engage and respond. Just to speak to how 
critical design is. Like in, in the early stages, we were like, okay, let's have a large table and everybody can sit around the table and fill out a response. But with a table, you're all sitting facing in and it sort of looks like an activity center. That's not really a space to reflect or to absorb rest or to have any sense of privacy. So we then inverted that idea and worked with our designer, Dan Kershaw, to create a kind of settee that faces out so that you have a moment where you can sit and you don't have to face anybody if you don't want to. You're not looking somebody in the eye. But you can also use that space if you want to face the response area and consider, you know, read what's, what's on there. The response space as the second part of this uh, concept was a space where we thought it would be meaningful to have our exhibition land in a place where we don't conclude anything and tie it up in a nice, neat ribbon, but rather open up the conversation further to our audience. Wendy and I were always very conscious of the fact that we wanted to provide a strong narrative that would reflect all of the research and historical understanding that we had, and that this would be a didactic space to some extent, but also that it would be a space where we are inviting further discourse and that we're not shutting down understanding or dialogue, but opening it up. And it can be intimidating or uncomfortable for curators to open up dialogue in a way that would not undermine, but suggest that there's not an authority there, <laughs> you know, um, but that these questions can be answered in a number of ways. Um, but we felt that that was really appropriate. I can't say that there was a single moment in which it occurred to us, but we eventually got to a place where we decided those four questions, what is the legacy of the Black figure in Western art? What is representation, what is abolition, who narrates history. If we invite, you know, these different scholars and people to to respond to them in the space, I say scholars as a broad term, it was, you know, an artist, a filmmaker, a, a professor of law and a, and a dean. But if we have them respond to these questions in the space, then they're providing a kind of model or example, you know, for our audience. And if our audience says, well, actually, I, you know, I disagree with that. I want to write this, you know, it provides them an, an example of, okay, now I can use my voice as well. So to have signed, authored labels within the space, and then to provide a space where our audience can, can also respond to the same questions is to suggest a kinship between them that their voices are part of this exhibition as well. I, I will say across the board, the responses have been thoughtful, you know, thought-provoking, and serious. And um, we've collected now around 7,000 responses. We're so privileged to have on board a, an interpretation fellow named Martina Lentino, who has been analyzing the responses so that we can learn from this experience to further, hopefully further implement kind of audience engagement um, in the future. It's been really interesting to see the extent to which our visitors are in their responses addressing power and collective action, individual agency. Never underestimate, you know, museum audiences. They, they understand power. <laughs> they really, really do. They understand curatorial power. They understand, they understand this question of who narrates history. And they want to talk about it. Have you and Wendy been thinking all at all about ways in which the Met might use continue to use these responses or what might happen to them? You know, by the end of the exhibition, I, I can't even imagine how many you'll have. Right. It's, it's been sort of overwhelming. I, we've learned so much already from them because of Martina's really good work. And so we're, we're trying to make the most of the opportunity we have to learn, reflect, and hopefully in the future develop new initiatives that would allow for this type of engagement to, you know, continue in meaningful ways. We plan on sharing the findings. Perhaps that will influence the way that, you know, content is created in exhibition spaces or permanent gallery spaces. 
with different themes in mind. And perhaps it will also, I mean, it was, it's been so encouraging to see the responses and that visitors seem to find it appropriate and exciting to lend their voice and also just engage with these questions in a kind of personal or reflective manner. I think also that it, as you mentioned earlier, you know, it signals that the conversation doesn't end with this exhibition. It's ongoing. It will continue to happen at the museum. It will continue to happen with audiences and that we need, you know, as diverse a range of, of future art historians to be coming in and helping us continue to engage with these questions. Um, you know, I think often about, you know, students who are coming to the Met and, and being inspired to want to become curators. And I think that it really opens up a space for what, how critical that role is, what kind of questions you're dealing with, um, but that, you know, it's our mandate to continue to engage with these questions. And, and we need many more people um, on board in this respect. I agree with you. And you posed the question of, you know, is this sort of scary for curators? I hope that curators will lean into this idea that we are, we're not there to provide an authoritative history or narrative. We're, we're, as curators, we're also there to kind of collect and organize experiences in the space and that other people's perspectives, of course, is part of that. And I think it can be a very empowering thing. I would, I would hope that would be how others view it as really part of the opportunity of curatorial work, as opposed to being something that threatens it. Yes, I definitely agree. And, you know, I worry often about the future of art history. And, you know, I think what this component of the show is really geared towards inspiring, exactly as you said, kind of what you can do as, as a curator and as an art historian, especially among, you know, generations, you know, particularly in this moment that want to take action and that, you know, and working with historic works of art that, that you can do that. So one last question I think we have time for that I'd love to get to and that you touched upon a bit earlier are kind of repercussions of a show like this for um, the Met's permanent collection galleries and I hope other museums are kind of looking at this and when they're thinking about how they might reinstall their permanent collection and wondering about what are some lessons from the exhibition that you will take away for future permanent collection installations and on what you see as the role that contemporary art can or should or maybe should not uh, play within this? Sure. A lot of thought went into how we would present a history of colonialism that would still allow audiences to appreciate the objects as works of art. And something that I have taken away from this is more confidence in the fact that our audiences not only want but are demanding and hungry for interpretation that moves beyond histories of making and of kind of craft and actually grapples with social histories. There's a real desire from our audiences to lean into those complex and fraught histories. And I feel more confident and assured that we can do that, <laughs> you know, um, and that our audiences and we will be better for understanding works of art on multiple levels. On the one hand, as extremely beautiful, moving, affecting, while also questioning some of the underlying ideologies that shaped or formed it. And that that duality is really important to understanding our humanity and our past and our present and to not be shy about addressing that. That's kind of been my takeaway. If the exhibition was an experiment in can we do this, will audiences respond? Will they appreciate that or will they be resentful of us presenting so much complexity? The, the overwhelming response has been they like it, they want it, the response space to me has been revealing again that they understand power. So when you don't discuss power in your interpretation, they're walking away knowing it 
and and going <laughs> well you didn't address the most obvious thing which is you know under what power structure for whom was this made and to project what type of narrative of power. So I, I just think that that for me, the biggest takeaway is to lean in and feel more confident in uh, presenting those complex and fraught histories um, and that it does not diminish a work of art. It demonstrates a respect for the work of art to acknowledge that it, it has these multiple kind of levels of meaning. In terms of the role contemporary art can play, that's certainly a question that a lot of curators are asking. For me, as a curator of 18th and 19th century art, you know, I, I've now worked on multiple exhibitions where contemporary art and historic art have been combined. And for me, I think specificity is the most important link between the historic art and contemporary art. I don't always appreciate historic art exhibitions that have a bunch of contemporary art at the end as a kind of an antidote to say, you know, this historic art has embedded in it these histories of violence and colonialism and contemporary artists today are addressing, you know, those histories. And it feels like um, an apology or a way of deferring to contemporary art and artists. I think it can be really um, not do any favors to the historic art or to the contemporary when it's done in that way. But so where Wendy and I drew the line was when there's a great deal of specificity, it can be really effective. In the case of this exhibition, we chose contemporary works that were created in response to Why Born Enslaved in particular. For us to not include them, it felt like that would be an omission. You know, that would be us actually saying, okay, the history stops with the object and its time, um, when, it, when clearly it, it didn't stop then. This conversation is being brought into the present. Um, and that's, you know, what I think is very intelligent about both works of art is that they don't provide a kind of easy band-aid or, <laughs> or solution to the problem. And instead, they're, I think they're just asking further questions about the present. I think there are so many different ways in which contemporary art can be used in conversation with historic art. And I and I'm really interested in that. Um, but I also, I think it needs to be done with a great deal of thought and care so that there's not a sort of diminishment of either the historic, the past or the present in, in, in the bringing of them together. Exactly. And, and not an oversimplification of the only way to get more audiences engaged with historic art is through connecting them to contemporary works, um, which I think is a huge oversimplification or a, a reason for the art historians or the curators to not put in the work with the historic works. You know, don't lean on contemporary art or artists to do that work. Again, I think one of the takeaways from this show in the response phase has been that um, audiences are paying attention to how we deal with historic works um, in their own right. And with Kara Walker and Kehinde Wiley bringing in the point that this is a sculpture that has continued to live on in, in popular culture and public imagination. Um, and it's an ongoing, you know, discussion that's still being had about what is the significance of this work even to, you know, to us in the year 2022. And I think it's a, you know, a very, very critical conversation to include but I'm fascinated by this conversation around the role of contemporary artwork should play within historic collection, particularly within permanent collections. And it's not an easy answer, but I love one, you know, answer that you've offered for us here with the show. Yeah, you were, you were just talking about the, the way this work has lived on and into the contemporary moment. One thing that's really fascinated me about Why Born Enslaved, but also the Cordiers and other works in the exhibition is the way that I'm going to quote from Wendy here because she always says this. She's so eloquent in, in how she phrases it, but she talks about the way that in the absence of other forms of representation, why born enslaved in Cordier's busts uh, and others have come to sort of stand in for that gap. In other words, we ask a lot of these works. You know, we know they're figments of the European imagination, but we want to see in them, you know, vestiges of authentic personhood, you know, that for Black audiences would give them a sense of cultural heritage, you know, a dignified image with which to identify. We, we, and so, you know, while as an art historian, it's my role to kind of elucidate 
the historical context in which these works were made um, and for whom they were intended, these works undeniably have had afterlives. You know, um, they've been subjectively interpreted by various um, audiences over time, over now hundreds of years. And that's led to various understandings. And that's not something I would ever deny, you know, or refute that people see different things in these works such that Beyonce would include Why Born Enslaved in a music video or a clothing advertisement um, or that Janet Jackson would have this in her home and that a lot of Black people own Why Born Enslaved and, and identify with the strength that they see in, in this person or the Kahenda Wiley. So I think the kind of way in which this image has become so subjectively interpreted is 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 part of part of the kind of history of of the work that I think again is is beyond sort of my curatorial purview and it becomes really about personal histories. Well, Elise, thank you so much. It was a pleasure to be in conversation with you, and congratulations um, again to you and Wendy on this exhibition and. Um, very grateful for your time today. Uh, thank you so much. It's a pleasure. We could have spoken for hours. Mm -hmm.